Hello everyone, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to the second week of the CAS Virtual Showcase 2021. This session we're going to be looking at physical computing. Really excited to welcome our two special guests today, Ben Davis and Joel Hodge. My name's Sarah Zaman, I'm the Outreach Manager for um, the North Eastern for Yorkshire and today's host for the session. We're also joined today by Pete Marshman, um, the Outreach Manager for CAS in the Central South. Pete will be the moderator, Dan, he, he will be monitoring the, um, the question window. Just before we start, I've got a couple of things um, to share. In terms of housekeeping during the session, please use the question window on the right-hand side of your screen to ask questions or share comments. The top of the window has got an orange rectangle which can be expanded or collapsed. Pete will be making notes of questions. These will be answered if time allows at the end. If time doesn't allow this, responses will be posted on the CAS forum and across CAS social media channels. Please tweet, retweet, post, repost, share and comment on today's event using the hashtag hash CASVirtual21. Remember the capital letters. And as a reminder, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, so time to introduce our first guest, Ben Davis. Ben is an Upper Key Stage 2 teacher with over 20 years of classroom experience. He's a specialist leader of education, a STEM associate facilitator, CAS community leader, Barefoot ambassador, resources developer and computing subject leader. He's very passionate about promoting learning strategies that allow children to deepen and apply their knowledge of computer science. OK, I'll hand over to you now, Ben. OK, and... So that is up my screen sharing now. Yes, it is. Right. Um, oops, so I'll drop that. Right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Although we, we can't actually see people, so I'll, I'll assume and I'll hope that some people are there. Um, Sarah's introduced me, but yeah, yes, I'm year six teacher, first and foremost, currently in my classroom um, with, with some computing stuff neatly placed behind me. Um, so in this session today, what I would like to do is just talk a little bit about how I've used the microbit over the last couple of years to get sort of physical computing up and running and really my successes and things that I've done to um, sort my problems out with getting physical computing started in the classroom. Now. Any of you that have sort of done any training in Pi Academy, anything where you, I think, as an adult, you've done some work with physical computing, you know how engaging it can be, that sort of fist pump moment that I still remember the first time I got an LED to switch on, and I wasn't the only person in the room. And we enjoy it, we get a buzz from it. Also, children, massively so. It's powerful and it offers real world application. They start understanding the uh, the links between things that happen on screen and things that happen in, in the wider world and don't just see particularly those taking their first steps in programming that it all just exists on screen however i would probably suggest that physical computing is underrepresented in the sort of the the breadth of the computing curriculum and if a talk with my primary teacher hat on it, it probably sort of stops at bbots in key stage in eyfs key stage one and doesn't again re rear its head until key stage three so why is that well i i would suggest it's because of the amount of hardware and stuff and things going missing and wires that are that need connecting and it's easier if we can keep everything on screen and keep keep it to one so I found that um, certainly in my own school and supporting colleagues in other schools, the micro bit is a really good starting point. Um, so what is the micro bit? So for those who don't know, there's one sort of flashing away that I'm trying to hold together with a bit of blue tack here. It'll just roll off. It's, um, it's a microcomputer. It has 25 LEDs as a form of the outputs on the front of it. It has other outputs as well. It's got a range of sensors, Bluetooth connectivity, radio connectivity as well, and it can be programmed using a variety of languages, most commonly 
using MakeCode website, using Python, or using Scratch. But the way you use Scratch with it is a slightly different way. Okay, just a quick overview there. Um, and then what you need to get started? Well, I think that's one of the Microbit's real benefits is it doesn't take much at all to get started with them. The connecting cable, the battery pack, which is op optional, if you don't want to have it tethered using the cable, the micro bit itself, and some device that you can use to connect to a programming environments. Um, I've mainly used Make Code and I've used it through a laptop. Um, there are other ways of accessing it, there are other languages that you can use, but for the purpose of just getting up and getting going, this is what I'd recommend. So once we've got those, then we need to look at the um, the programming environment that we're going to use and apologies for those of you that have experienced this already just quickly go through so we have block-based programming we have an emulator here which will run the program so you don't need to download it onto the device itself to check that it's work which is works which is really useful when you're looking at debugging and trying to identify where the bug might exist in the program Asset menus down here, and obviously blocks arranged into these menus. Nice, I know this is common amongst other things, but I do think a lot of value in having this basic menu, which are the sort of the, the, the blocks that can get you to go in with programs really quickly. Option blocks and to flip it in between, if they want to do look at some text-based programming using JavaScript, and download button there if for you to then download and flash the program onto the device itself in the same way that you would transfer a, a so you, you would transfer a document to an external hard drive and i've always sort of used this and i've used it micro bits with as young as children in year three but i've always done it with children that have had some experience of block programming mainly scratch but They've always had some idea that there's a there's a sequence and they, they know that much that there's a flow and that they they've moved on from scratch junior with things going across so they know that the program is reading vertically. Um, so what I would do with them is start off is to show them a program like this, show run the emulator so that they get the idea and get them just to draw the links between what they see in the program and what they see on screen, and then things like so just predict well, how could I make this how can I make the eyes bigger how could I change the shape of the smile those things children having having an idea coming up and we're not doing this in, individually yet doing it on the whiteboard they're coming up and they're just seeing the impact that it has on the micro bit if they have no knowledge of them then then I get out the device and show that it can go on the device as a I think that's quite a, a little hook for them and it gets that sort of appetite of them wanting to use the device itself moving on then the first activity that i've used when introducing them to the class here it's i've called it image races but just just giving it giving it a title the whole idea is is to get the children actually used to the process of downloading and transferring the program to the micro bit so something that could be problematic and something that if you're doing a unit where you're using the micro bits really you, you're going to be the children are going to be using it a lot they're going to be doing that and it's something that could trip them up um i can remember being in a session with phil bag once when he he said that that physical computing in a primary school can turn it into just a firefighting lesson where you're just jumping around from station to station trying to fix things and you never actually get any of the conceptual development done in there the children don't really understand you don't get the lesson done because all you ever seem to do is just fix things and, and as i said fight the fires so this idea of image races is to do this so what we do is once they've got that idea of it takes those two blocks to make a program we then do a first person to show me a micro bit with a and we've got some just examples here for so first person to show me a picture of a micro bit with a picture of a heart on it and the idea then being that the children quickly program it they transfer the program on and they hold the micro bit up and it's i mean up to teacher do you, how you want it in the class do you want it tethered through the usb 
do you want to use in, in the battery pack? That's, but we're giving them a, um, a competitive reason for downloading the program and just an idea. They're just rehearsing it. You do it five or five or six well, five or six times. You get some that get frustrated. I've done this with adults as well, and adults get even more frustrated and even more competitive. Um, but you're actually allowing them to develop the fluency of transferring the program so it doesn't become something that sidetracks your lessons and becomes a barrier to learning later. Um, a nice tweak onto this, what I found, is, is then taking it a bit further, still doing the idea of having a race, but bringing in the idea of abstraction. So first of all, so you're sort of asking children to think about with those 25 LEDs, how are they going to be able to represent something? So here we've got a representation of an aeroplane. And these two here were both done um, one um, trying to represent an animal. So I'll give you just a second to see if you can think what it might have been. But they were trying to represent an elephant. And we talked about how in abstraction you you pick out the key elements of something and try to communicate them. So if you can if you can make out this one is supposed to represent the elephant's ears and this one is supposed to represent the trunk. But lot, lots of little activities like that. You can also do flashcard activities, do the Richard and Judy, if you can remember that, you pay, we say, where children have got words on flashcards and they've got to get their partner to say the word by pro programming an image on the micro bit, but all these things to get them used to using it, short programs and get them transferring it. As their competency grows, then I've moved them on to thinking about animation and how they can sequence. Uh, uh, earlier I mentioned this has always been with children that have had some previous experience. So this hasn't been so much a direct, this has been, well, what happens if you put one or two images together? and then getting to think about, well, we're sort of creating an animation, we're creating a sequence. And through just through questioning and getting them to explore things and asking them questions, can you give it a title? So we know that it's a holiday diary, as this screen says, can you add something at the end so we know it's the end? Can you make certain slides stay on for longer? And the idea of them transferring things that they know from scratch, knowing that they want to use the weight block, but then they're looking for, well, the weight block isn't here, but what, what's going to do the same job? So transferring that understanding from one programming environment to another, I think is quite valuable because it shows they, they understand what underpins those blocks. Right. Um, going, oh, this, this is, um, I think, just is very, 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 very simple, but it's really useful if you're ever using microbit, particularly with animations, just using something like this five by five grid to get the children to just all they're doing is sort of scribbling in to identify which ones they're going to they are going to light up to create their patterns or to create their animations i would be sort of i if you are doing any sort of animations try and keep them simple because of the size of the blocks sometimes you can go off the children can go off the page quite a bit off the screen and, and struggle to sort of see where they are in their program and that's when you as things get more complicated, that's when you need to make the switch to text-based programming. Right, um, then I've also made use of the input sensors with them. Um, and once you start bringing the input sensors into the program in, and using the blocks that related to these, you can see on this image here, this is from the, um, the emulator, that you start getting other bits added to it. So the newer micro bits have a touch sensor here, They've got a sound meter, there's a thermometer on them, so, and you can connect them up to create sounds. And when I've introduced the sensors to children, I've sort of done a modified prim approach where I've given children, I've started off just giving them some short programs. So, so I think one thing that's great about the micro bit is two blocks and you've got a program that's that actually, this is what children find quite interesting quite infusing but also doing that means if you're just doing short programs that you haven't got that much to predict or that much to investigate or modify if you're using a prim approach so i'll do it where i'll give them several programs and ask them well having a look at these and a and c have been rotated and ask can you identify what the output of each program is what's going to happen with each program 
and then structure asking them, well, in each program, can you identify the condition that needs to be met for the output to take place? So prim, but predictions, but in a similar way. And then for the modification, just given asking them to do certain things, can you change the input to, so it's a different button, this word, can you change the input to a quieter sound, change the words that are displayed? And because the programs can be so short, I don't have to worry about giving the programs out to the children. I can actually you know, expect them to build it. And again, if they know how Scratch works or, or other block-based programming environments, they're used to using the colors of the blocks to look for the, in the right place in the asset menu. And then we'll do some activities again using the, the same program where I'll just ask them, give them uh, statements about the program and they have to identify which program fits the statement. So it would be which program, questions like which program uses a button as its input, which program uses LEDs as their output, which program will play a sound. And you know they're, they're using their whiteboards, they're using cards, whatever, symbols that are a b c d or all of them um i think they're a nice sort of activity so you get to understand that they are well assessing their understanding of the program and the blocks and i think well, i think a lot of things with, with computing when you if you do it well in terms of children's learning you can get quite a lot out of very little if you're concentrating on their understanding of what's going on rather than getting them to write really long programs because you're interested in what's happening on screen and the output, not the not the actual learning that's taking place. So, um, and some of the things that we've done with sensors, we've, we've made um, sort of musical micro bits. So when you move them in different, so it plays notes and depending if you move it to the left, right, up or down, it plays different notes and then done a little orchestra. Um, there was an occasion once where we were doing some science work and we didn't have any light meters, so we just quickly wrote a program to use the micro bit as a light meter in a more extended design sort of DT come computing lessons. We've created night lights where the light sensor, when the light drops to a certain level, a face or some sort of a happy gesture comes on the LEDs, but they've then created a house for that. You know, sort of something that sits around the micro bit, so that hides the battery pack and things, but it adds to there. And also just things like temperature alarms, so putting them in different places in the classroom to find out which is the hottest and which is the coldest. Um, and then, because I'm, I'm aware, I'm getting full time already. If you are thinking of using a micro bit in the classroom, a fantastic tool that's provided by the um, Micro Bit Education Foundation is micro bit classroom and in that I shall, shall rush through you can it's again it's an online environment but you can set up the program that you want your class to use you can add notes to it so so it could be that you're giving them part of a program that you're asking them to complete and then once you've set that up and you've, you can see here where it says share your code with students it then creates a url for you and a classroom you share that with the children, they go and log on using the credentials that are displayed on the screen. And then you get a secure area where you've got that sort of master eye where you can just drop into, you see, they, once, they, it says once they start, you'd have all, they would put their first name in when they log in. So you'd have the children's names here. You can click on that and see what they're doing, but you can also take somebody's somebody's program and then share it with the rest of the class so it's so they can see it on their screen um it was really it's really really useful it was particularly useful um during the first lockdown as a way of actually doing some work at um doing some computing work that that you could interact and give some children feedback with um just to finish off last slide there and on there i, I put some links um to places where there are microbit resources available in here there there is a scheme of work you'll find for key stage two and key stage three is a progressive scheme of work i know the key stage two because i was involved with it goes from year three up to year six and two lessons per year group and um joe and i did some of the key stage three stuff as well there are 
with um, coal club resources. There are some micro bit units with that. Scratch stuff, um, scratch with scratch and micro bit is being used in a slightly different way in that you use the micro bit itself to make things happen in the scratch programming environment. So you, you use you use the micro bit as an input. Um, there's one activity where you can sort of guide a fish around the screen and depending on which way you're tilting it, it will go. One um, one of the year six, one of the NCC units, year six unit focuses on micro bits and some ones down the bottom that um, developed by ARM processors. Um, they're focusing around using the micro bit in the context of the Internet of Things. And I think that does, so apologies, took me about two minutes over my time that I'm, that I'm recording, but um, that does get me to the end. So there we are, let's sort of get started with a, a micro bit. Thanks, Ben. That was absolutely brilliant. Really informative. Always learning new things off you. I particularly liked the um, your links to abstraction with those creating the images. So I think I'll be using uh, that next time I do my bit. So thank you. Brilliant. Loads of ideas. Loads of links. Um, right. Our second guest. Let me introduce our second guest, Joe Hodge. So Joe's a year six teacher and learning and technology lead at Our Lady of Lords in Southport. She's been a CAS master teacher and community leader for the past seven years. She more recently became a Barefoot Ambassador. Currently within a school role, Joe's acting in an, in an advisory role in primary computing as lead practitioner at Hope University. Joe particularly enjoys tinkering with physical devices such as crumbles, microbits and spherules. Brilliant. Um, OK, so I'm going to hand over um, to Joe. When... Thanks, Sarah. If you can give me, that's lovely. I'll get myself going. Hopefully, you can all see my PowerPoint. That's great. Um, thanks for that. Also, as well, we've recently become a digital schoolhouse. So after this session, if you feel that you want in more sessions on crumbles or microbits or anything like that, I'm available to deliver those as well. Just getting that in there. Um, can you see me, Ben? All right. Yeah. You covered my PowerPoint for some reason there. I don't know what's happened there. Uh, my screen's gone with everybody showing everybody. Can I we just minimise it? We can, Ben, if you just want to pop off and um, and then there's just Joel and we can see your screen fine. That's great because I can't see my PowerPoint, Ben. I, 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 can see it. I know, but I can't see it. <laughs> I can so see what you. Do I, need, what do I, need to do? I love you, Ben, but not that much. What do I need <laughs> to do? Time. It's fine. Hang on. All right. Ready I'll, just, uh, I'll just close that down. Hopefully you can see me. Yeah. OK, brilliant. So I'll get going. So what I'm going to do, hopefully I'm going to try not to cross over with Ben, but Ben's touched on a lot of things that I might talk about today. So that's great because it saves us a little bit of time as well. But I'm going to talk about sort of my journey to crumble a little bit and then share some of the things that I had done, which might be useful to you as well. So I'll get going. OK, so. Hang on. I'm not oh, there we go. Brilliant. So the crumble controller, very similar to the micro bit as its physical compute in the same and you can connect it. I'm going to show you a little video in a second. It's made by Redfern Electronics. There's a little link at the bottom and they've got a lovely little video on their website which shows you. So I'm going to show you a snippet of that today in a second. But and it's at the bottom right if you can see it. So you can see that it's got, you know, you can add devices, you can put inputs, outputs on, you can control things and it's really, really cheap. Um, which is a, a bonus, I think, for primary teachers. We want something that we can use. It's easy, you know, cheap and free. You can add things to it, like sensors. You can add sparkles, which are lights. Um, and if you look at the code sort of interface there, it's very similar to Scratch. If you notice the way the code looks, the colours of the code are very similar. Um, it's one of those things that's a really easy way to get into physical computing. And... I'll tell you now, the hardest thing with the crumble, that's my dog's apologies, the hardest thing with the crumble is actually not the code, it's actually the connecting of the things. So we'll see, we'll watch a little video and you might get a flavour and understand what I'm talking about there. So I'm just going to play this video, hopefully it'll work. This is a slightly different one, this is a prototype crumble, but it gives you an idea of how you connect it and how it connects to your computer as well. So I'll just play that now, hopefully.
Okay, so I'm just going to move on. Hopefully, brilliant. That gives you an idea because obviously when you're doing physical computing, it's much better to see people face to face and actually experience using the crumble and having a look at it. Um, so as, as you can see, you can connect sparkles to it. You can connect moses and servos. So you can do almost anything with it, really. I mean, anything you want to make that you want to move or control, you can use a crumble to do that. Um, and switches and buzzes, sensors, etc. So you could have, you could make a buggy, it can hit, you can make it not hit if it touches something, it makes a sound or the lights flash. You can do all sorts of things with it. Um, on the left hand side, you can see this diagram. This diagram is my life, to be honest. And this is what I use all the time. I know Ben has, behind him has got a beautiful big crumble, which he might show us later on his wall. And I've got a laminated version of one as well. But this diagram is really useful to teach children where things plug in, when inputs, outputs, and you can have that conversation with them. Um, because as I said, the hardest thing with the children is actually connecting it, but it does link really well with any sort of electricity units you've got going on. I know in year six, it links well with DT. So it's very cross-curricular because I'm a big believer, as it, as it was in my introduction, about cross-curricular computing. That is my lifeblood and everything I do is cross-curricular. Every lesson I deliver is done in that way. So the crumble fits that, is fit for purpose really. And if you can see on the right hand side, that is the starter kit and that is where I started. I bought those starter kits for my for my my school. And you basically get 12 crocodile clips, you get a switch, you get two sparkles, you get the crumble, you get a battery pack and a USB connector. So really for 24 pounds, which I think in today's money is pretty cheap, you can have a start and you can get something going really easily. Now, if you see in the bottom that sparkle matrix, I know Ben was talking about the micro bit matrix and using it for animations. This possibly could be a way of doing an animation with a crumble. As I say, it's got 25 LEDs. They're all numbered. I mean, what I'm going to do with these, I'm planning to do them with year three because they do the Egyptians. So I'm going to get them to program their own Egyptian hieroglyphs. And, you know, we can introduce repeat loops and things like that as well with that. So there's lots of possibilities within that. Um, but as I say, you can literally connect a, a variety of things. And there's loads of websites that do it. You know, people like Kitronics and Redfern themselves. There's loads of places you can get the resources. So this is just a start of an example. So the, what, the one on the left is a little cube and I call it the light, the Christmas cube, we called it. And basically the children made their own little Christmas light and they cut out sections they put tissues in them and then they programmed the lights to go inside so that was a nice little quick project and it linked to nets as well if you want to do something different in your maths lessons that's a nice way to do it the two in the middle link very much because ben who's on the call with us today has just written a unit which i'll talk about a little bit at the end but he's just done a fairground unit for year five with the ncce and actually these were fairground rides that we made quite a few years ago when i first started using the crumble these with my year six where I just let them be free and do whatever they wanted. And this is what they came up with. Some fairground rides was one of them. On the right hand side, that's like a robot. And I'm going to talk about my bottle buggy in a second, because that is my lifeblood of any teaching I do with the crumble, crumble. I always use a bottle buggy as a starter point. And um, instead, they turned it on its head and they made a robot. But, you know, that could be anything, couldn't it? It could be a dinosaur. It could be, you know, it could be a robot again. It could be a gladiator. It could be a Viking warrior, it could be whatever you wanted. Um, the concept's there, isn't it? So you can build whatever you need from that. Now, a few years ago, we went for the ICT and they smart, and I asked the children what they liked about a creative curriculum, why it was something that they appreciated. And they said it was fun and a different way to learn. So cross-curricular is definitely the way to go. And physical computing just engages the children every time. You can never get over that point where when a light turns on or a motor moves, that joy, that I always say it's that joy, isn't it? It's that eureka moment that they've actually done that and they've programmed it. So 
a few years, about four years ago now, Sarah's on the call with us. She went with us. We went to Malawi as part of sort of a, a charity organization with Ripple. And basically we raised funds and we took over a, a raft of kit, you know, laptops, crumbles, micro bits. And it was in liaison with the Uni of Manchester as well. And the idea is we were going to teach computing to secondary students because, because they don't have the opportunities that we have. Because I was a bit like, well, I'm a primary teacher. Why am I going? But apparently, you know, we were going in teaching them primary concepts because they just didn't have the resources or the materials. Um, and part of that was developing a crumble project. Now, when I'd got there, Sarah, her head of me, had already made um, like night lights with paper and cut out holes and got the motors going. And we needed another project. And it was literally like we're in the middle of nowhere on a lake, you know, in a hut. This is how basic it was. And they said, we need another project. So it was like, what have we got with us? You know, it was literally like that. So we had some plastic water bowls. We had some card from the microbit. And lo and behold, the bottle buggy was born. And to be honest, it's been such a great way to develop things and it can become so many things and it's cheap. Um, and you can see a couple of the girls there in the Kapand, that was Kapand that we went to, um, because we're on Lake Malawi and it was in, in Carter Bay, which is sort of uh, the north sort of end when you fly in, it's sort of up north from there. So yeah, brilliant opportunity, but just amazing to see how, you may make sure you realize how lucky you are, let's put it that way. So these are just a few pictures really from it, because I think it's always nice to see the children, isn't it? But you can see their secondary age, but this guy on the left here, this is apparently, they carried the project on when I left and they sent me lots of videos and this guy apparently had done the bottle project and then he programmed it and then he danced and sang with it. And it, so it was like almost like a little bit like, you know, you've ever seen that robot dancing where they do the robots dance with the people. So he did it with the crumble, which I thought was fantastic. How, you know, how innovative was that? Um, but you can see here, the classroom's really basic, concrete floor, blackboard, that's it. So obviously us coming with, kit and computers were just made their day really they just absolutely loved it but there was like four to a computer but you can see how focused they were um and they and as i say it was just a fantastic opportunity but it got me going into crumbles really and appreciate how wonderful they were because in my opinion if you can code in a country like malawi with a crumble you can code anywhere um so i'll just i'll show i'm only going to show you a little bit because i know i'm aware of the time but just to show you, this is a couple of the crumbles going here. So they did sort of a random code and they got it moving around the floor. Just really simple coding, just getting the motors moving. Okay, I'll move on. Hopefully we get a flavour for that. So from that, obviously, I, as I said, I worked at Hope University, I do a lot of stuff with Hope. And I was working with the year two students. So basically I went in and I delivered a crumble lesson to them and I started from the beginning. Now, when we were looking at the diagram of crumble before, I gave, I always give them lots of top tips when I'm using a crumble. Things like I spend maybe 10 minutes of the lesson just looking at the crumble and get them to tell me what they can see on it, what they can read on it and things like that. I get them practicing doing this with the crocodile clips and putting them in. Um, the first thing I ever do with the crumble is I literally turn a light on and that's it and I make it go red. And I think you can probably guess why I do that because at the end of the day, I'm checking they've connected it correctly because like Ben said before, I don't want to spend half my lesson firefighting. So before they even code much, I'll just say, make it make it turn the red light on. And I can just look around that class of 30 children and know that they're all connected um, because we have enough for one each crumble. So that's a really nice way. So those are the sort of things I share with the students so that when they deliver the lesson, then they write a lesson plan and they deliver the same lesson. So that's where the year four Roman chariots came from because the year fours were doing Romans and it was a nice way to link to that. And you can see the basis of the bottle, bottle buggy there and what you can turn it into. This is one example. Um, so as you can see here as well, it links with science and it links with DT and art. And you can see from that basic bottle became all of these different designs. So I, like when I do the children, I did exactly the same with the students. I just gave them a box full of materials and said, here's what you do. This is how you make the buggy go. Now it's up to you. I want you to design a Roman chariot. I want you to add horses. I want you to add people on the top, off you go. And then their creativity comes into play because I don't like giving children ready-made things. I like them to create and start from scratch almost. 
you give them an idea and you let them run with it. And that's the thing, they've got the basis, off they go. So this is a really nice one. And obviously I've written a lesson plan for this as well. Um, this one is another one that I'm currently sort of halfway working on at the moment. And this is uh, linking to a barefoot code tracking unit, which I'd written. So what I did was I reinvented my own unit really, I've changed it. So I start with a bit of code cracking and it like links obviously to history, science and DT like the others do. But I've introduced sort of the prim. Now Ben's actually talked about prim because I'm a big believer in prim and I'm starting to introduce it into everything. And if you don't know what prim is, it's predict, run, investigate, modify and make. So it's basically the universities have worked on this with two sentence and they've found that this is a really good way to help children become better programmers, basically better coders. And it uses sparkles and switches. Now you can see here, this program in the middle is really a simple program. So, you know, I would give them this and say, what letters is this going to make? Those are the sort of questions to say, what letters is that going to be, children? Well, let's have a look. So it's going to go on for one second, one second, and then it's going to go for three seconds. What's the one second represent? Well, it's a dit, and what does the three seconds of the jar? So it's getting them to understand how they can create their own code. And it's just a starting point, but you know, that could have repetition in, it could be all sorts of things we could put in there as well. But it's just a starting point because I do believe that children need some code to get going really. Um, this is another bit of an example from it. This is a little bit of a high level one. Like Ben said, you know, when he had his four pieces of code up, it's a similar idea, you know, which block activates the switch, can you work it out? What letter is represented? You know, what could you do to modify? So they predicted the code, they then, we let them run the code, and then I give them chance to sort of investigate and modify sort of together really, to see whether their prediction's correct, and then they can modify it as well. So it's a really, I think it really builds confidence in children because they actually understand what each individual block is doing. Because the problem I found before is children sometimes will slap loads of blocks on the screen and press and they'll go, it's not working, miss, I can't work it out. And I'll say, well, why is it not working? What's the reason? They say, oh, I, I don't know. Well, what's that block? What are you wanting the program to do? You know, they don't know half the time. So sometimes pulling it back like Ben and I both do is just that little bit of code gets them going. Um, on the bottom right hand side, you can see as well, um, this is some of Phil Bag's stuff, which he's brilliant. He's got some fantastic stuff for Crumble. He is called Mr. Crumble, I think that's his name. And not, so he, he has loads of resources on his Codic website for the Crumble as well. It's absolutely brilliant. So hopefully I've answered enough questions. There's a big version of the Crumble that I was talking about, really good resource, resource but to be honest, you could just blow it up and laminate it and you'd have the same tool or put it on your interactive whiteboard, that's fine. So Redfern themselves have some really nice projects as well, which I've dipped into because I've used a lot of Crumb at Co Club where they've made like Christmas reindeers because that bottle buggy, as I said, can become anything. It can be a reindeer, it can be um, a lobster. I've seen someone make it into a lobster before now. It can be whatever you want. It's just a foundation and it holds everything as well. If you think about it, it holds all the gubbins and stuff so they can do whatever they want with it then. Phil Bags Code website, fantastic, loads of resources on there. And then of course, I've got a plug, good old Ben's unit on the fairground unit, which again, is, you know, he'll build on that. And he talks a lot about connecting the, the crumble really, because I wouldn't go, I would really start simple with a crumble. That's one thing I would say is really start simple, just connect to light, get him to light it and see how it works first before you start connecting motors and things, because that's another, you know, that's another concept altogether. Um, and I think I'm more or less on time. And that's me done, if that's OK. And that's, I'll stop. Thanks, Joe. That was absolutely amazing. Um, I know how much you love, personally know how much you love crumbles. And I know all the ex about all the exciting uh, sort of projects that you've done a lot in the past few years. And um, the Malawi stuff looks amazing. We had a brilliant time, didn't we? It was really good. We did. And I knew you'd want to chip in there. I'm, I'm, am I am I stopping present? I'll change presenter to you. There we go. No, it's absolutely fine. But um, yes, thank you. Brilliant. Um, no, it was it was really good. Um, and if you follow Jo on Twitter as well, you'll see lots of her um, crumbled projects on there. Um, so thank you so much. Can't wait to see the uh, slides. Everyone, you'll get the slides sent out to you afterwards. Um, Pete, are there any questions in the question window for Jo and um, Ben? There are a couple of questions coming, but I think probably what's come out of it is just everyone sort of thinks how fast, fantastic some of the examples are that we've just been through as well. 
so um, there's something um, around sort of um, Ben's work around sort of sharing about Microbit Classroom that seems to be something people have kind of new and they're going to go and have a look at. Uh, we've got Fab Session, great to see children's work and I think that's what really comes to life isn't it when you actually show kind of you know real work from the classroom that's what really kind of gets you thinking. Um, and then I love the cross-curricular um, examples shared as well. Um, so it's just some really, really, really nice comments. I do have a couple of questions. Um, probably uh, this one's directed more for you, uh, Ben. So I've got something around, um, can microbits interact with other microbits? There we are. Um, they, they can, there's the, um, so the radio antenna so you can you can send messages from one to another and there's a, there's a great sort of rock rock paper scissors stone activity that when, if you go to the make code website which just so you you get two when you shake them and depending which one comes up and it it then sort of tracks the scores on them and, and things so there's there's lots of little um nice little sort of make projects that you can do where and sort of sending them i think with one of them you send a picture of a duck to another one and depend and then depending on it uses variables but it just it's a compatibility test so if the duck appears with a heart next to it that you know that the person that you send it to is is particularly enamored with you and if not then you know it's it's the other way but yeah there's there's lots of fun little projects that you can do with them and again it when I've done those with children, it's just sort of, it's very simple and it captures their imagination. And as Joe was saying, it's something you can start as a small acorn and let their excitement and their sort of natural tinkering take them places with it. Definitely. So, yeah. I mean, can I just add that? Uh, you know, microbits are really nice for pedometers. They're a nice thing to get them in. You can introduce a lot of the things through that as well. I don't know if that year six unit is pedometers, is it, Ben? I haven't really looked. Uh, use that one yet so, yeah that's a really nice way because you can build in dt and you can design a strap and things like that so that's a nice way to get cross curricular in as well oh thank you sir i don't think we've got time for any more questions pete but um if anybody wants to um add any more questions they can go into the cas forum or you could put it in the cas primary group um thank you Okay, so we'll need to come to an end. Um, at the end of this webinar, a short survey will appear on the screen. I would be really grateful if you could take a minute to complete the survey. A recording of this webinar will be available on the CAS YouTube channel as soon as, um, well, in the next couple of days. Finally, we hope to see you at um, some of the other sessions in the CAS virtual showcase. We've got two great sessions happening tomorrow. In fact, it's completely oversubscribed. I think we're on 52 for it, the Barefoot Computing um, EYFS resources session. Um, and at 5 p.m., we've got an Instagram live event looking at top tips for trainee teachers. So get booking onto more sessions on our site if you haven't done so. Please do continue to spread the word about uh, computing at school. Final thank you to Joe, to Ben, to Pete for his lovely support in questions. Um, and that's us done for today. So thanks for joining. Have a lovely rest of the day and bye for now. Thank you.